I'm glad to say that over the past century or so, the opinion that a person's bodily autonomy is to be respected has spread widely. It was, what, 60 years ago? You could slap your secretary on the ass and she was supposed to pretend to like it? Well, I'm sure that still happens, especially with vulnerable people like migrant workers, but it's frowned upon and illegal, and the woman actually has a chance of winning the lawsuit now. And hey, we're all about spanking at it had to be said. But only if it's consensual. So I like that trend. Hope it continues. I just wish it was more common to believe in consent for more things. Nowadays, we consider it absolutely unacceptable to blame short skirts or getting drunk or going out after dark for getting raped. The rape victim didn't consent to sex or even being touched or catcalled. Consent is the line between sex and rape. Without consent, even touching is a violation, and not only in an intimate setting. Some people who fall over don't want you to touch them either. Kids don't necessarily want to be picked up. Again, all this is easier to understand for people nowadays because more of us have an understanding that our bodies belong exclusively to ourselves. We are the sovereign dictators over our meat sacks. Unless the person touching us has a badge because there's an entire class of people who merely assume your consent. They have spells like constitutions and authority and uniforms that magically relieve them of all obligation to ask for consent or face consequences for the suffering they cause. They can tell us what to do by using magic words like the law and orders. So we have to do what they say or face whatever punishment they decide. These people are your rulers. In case you were thinking it at no point in this video, what I like to imply living under the thumb of, the, of a ruling class is equivalent to rape. I'm not comparing them. They're different things. I'm talking about a system. Call it class society, the state, capitalism, or just the status quo. Living under this system means your life is planned, regulated, and limited in order to keep you ignorant and make other people rich. It means you and everyone you care about is lied to about the world from birth, tricking you into accepting bad ideas and supporting bad systems that kill people every day. So I think it's important to ask if consent matters in other things, too. Now, you could argue that you never consented to be born. And that's true, too, but well, it doesn't really change anything, does it? You could say you didn't consent to the culture, which is also a system. Culture or religion or other ideologies could be just as oppressive as any other force. And of course, these things, culture, the state, the economic system, they're all intimately related. But culture is also distinct from the other forces I talk about more often. Usually people don't mind the culture they're familiar with or the culture they've adopted. Culture is inevitable, something that will necessarily exist in any group. And to some extent, you can change the culture. In fact, you do since culture is always changing and you're a part of it. You can't change the purpose of the government, the police, the prison, the corporation, or the market. These institutions have never, at any time in their history, existed to serve the people. They've never been consensual. They're tools of force. And unlike culture, they're inventions of history, not nature. So they're not inevitable. So that's what we're talking about today. If you study so-called political science like I do, you'll get told that the legitimacy of the state rests on two things, consent and coercion. The idea is, even though 
at root it relies on force because the state provides some kind of services which they they tell us only states could possibly provide it creates some measure of consent for its existence this is a flawed understanding of the state and a big stretch of the definition of consent I've made a whole video you can watch on what the state is, and the link is in the description, but what you'll learn there in a nutshell is the state has always been predicated on force. It establishes a hierarchical relationship where consent is not asked for. It forces people to comply and to finance their own oppression. What's more, there could be no democratic state for all the people, or workers state for the entire working class. The state can only create and serve a small minority of the population, which becomes the ruling class. Some people approve of what states do, but they have no say, like fans watching a sports ball game. And why do they approve? Because of propaganda. You might want to watch my video on that, too, in the description, too. The PR of the ruling class uses a variety of justifications, like justice and economics and the social contract that they keep forgetting to ask us to sign, so that you defend the system to the death before you realize you don't have to. The people at the top, from business moguls and their marketing teams to the news to academia, find ways to obfuscate and complicate things, to confuse you, when actually it's all quite simple. The ruling class is in charge until we overthrow them. If you analyze what they do through that lens, things might actually make sense. If rulers were honest and open about what they did and then gave us a choice whether or not to accept it, no one would put up with it. But because we've been subject to their dictates our whole lives and because we're conditioned to accept any kind of oppression and violence if it's for some illusory common good, we don't question this relationship of domination. Now, depending how old you are and where you grew up, you might have taken sexual education classes, and you might have learned what consent actually means. In the world of sex, I've been told, it's not consensual if it's based on lies or fear of what will happen if you say no. And yet, that's precisely our relationship to the state. Same goes for school or the market. Follow their dictates. Or face punishment. The school and the market are largely products of the state, though, so it all comes back to this self-legitimating authority at the heart of everything. The same can be said of other institutions, which, upon learning their history and discovering their purpose, you might decide do not benefit you or the people around you. I suggest reconsidering money, debt, and property as institutions, too. When did you consent to the commodification of everything? Some people having exclusive ownership over something to make a profit. Something that everyone needs, like food, housing, clothing, or medicine, rather than letting everyone have access to it. When did you agree to let a tiny minority of the population control all the best land and buildings and infrastructure? When did you consent to a world where you're only allowed to survive if you work for someone else on their own terms? We follow their rules out of fear and ignorance, not consent. If you're still not sure whether or not you consent to be ruled, let me ask you a few questions. Can I stop you in the street and expect you not to get mad? Can I demand to search your pockets or your bag or your car? Hey. I'm just checking to see if you have weapons or drugs. Is that my business? Can I stop you from walking away? Can I put handcuffs on you? Can I kidnap you and throw you in a cage? Can I draw a gun on you for refusing to obey me? Can I shoot you and face no punishment? No? So why is it just obey the law when the police do it? Did you consent to the rule of law? Did you consent to any of the laws or any of the punishments? Did you consent to letting the police enforce the laws? 
So why do we have all these institutions? Do you know their history? Do you know how these decisions get made? Who decides and who benefits? No, and it's secret, so you're not allowed to know. Of course, no one's ever asked you if you consent because of our double standard on the question. Consent matters in normal relations between people, as everyone knows. It's a normal daily thing. No office worker or cashier is stopping you in the street, calling their friends to subdue you and dragging you away in handcuffs. I mean, they, they might, conceivably, if you were hurting people. But even then, they might start by exchanging words with as much civility as the other person's behavior allows for. That's the world we know when there aren't police around. But the police and other agents of the state have unlimited power over your body because of the law or the Constitution. Some people brought up under capitalism say, we have actually consented to all this just by living here. Or we consent to the entire system because we use the roads it produces, or something like that. So if we do one thing, we consent to everything. Or wage labor is voluntary, because we have some measure of choice where we work. Or if we don't vote, we consent. But we're not allowed to complain about anything the system does, regardless of whether voting could have affected it. Is it still consenting if you've changed your mind? Or, or we agreed to a social contract with the state sometime before we were born because some philosophers said so, and so on and so on. There's always an excuse for why you shouldn't be free. Likewise, in response to my urging people to look at how systems work, people have told me, it's everyone's fault. We're all to blame either for doing what we can to survive under this system, or for failing to stop it. No, that's the system excusing itself, the propaganda coming through your mouth. It's the same as blaming someone for existing. The system causes all these problems for all of us, and we have to live with them. The way they've set things up, it's almost impossible not to contribute somehow to the problem. Any consumption nowadays could be bad for the environment or bad for the workers. It's almost impossible to avoid helping the rich get richer because that's what most jobs do. It's not impossible to resist, but it's really hard on your own. You can build alternatives to jobs and money, but it takes cooperation. I think responsibility and blame are integral to our understanding of consent. After all, someone's keeping this system going. Even though no one consents to these systems because we've never been asked, some people are more responsible for them than others. For example, if you vote, you could say you're supporting the system, underscoring its legitimacy. But voting could be just out of protest or necessity, and we've been told voting is how to change things, and while that's pretty much just another lie, most vot voters don't actually think of it that way. Plus, in some places, you get fined if you don't vote. So voters are only slightly to blame. Like consumers and taxpayers. But what about the people who work for the system? Politicians and bureaucrats get their money f and power from the system. They believe in it as strongly as anyone, even if only for their own purposes. They're partly responsible for the system and its violence. Then you've got lobbyists and, of course, the corporate execs that they work for. These are the people who use the system as it was intended to be used, to make themselves richer at everyone else's expense. They provide incentives for politicians and bureaucrats. They, too, are integral to this system. I would argue police and soldiers are the most to blame for the system, followed by teachers and the media. They, sorry if that offends you. They may not have consented to be ruled by the system, but they have consented to enforce it. Likewise, security guards, who are kind of an extension of the police's power, just without the same authority. 
I don't necessarily judge any of these people as individuals. In fact, I'm sympathetic. After all, they're forced to do some kind of work just to survive. But there's no doubt they're propping up a system of violence. You may have noticed that the people who bear the most responsibility for the state of things get punished the least. They refuse all blame for the suffering they cause. They're protected from responsibility for, by the system that they work for. Spokespeople of the system, like politicians in the news, might wrap up entire affairs with propaganda phases like, we failed as a nation, as if we all unconsciously did what a few people actually did deliberately. Soldiers rarely get punished for their actions, but their job, after all, is to invade and occupy foreign land, to kill and torture and lock people up as ordered. Same with the police. Just doing my job means harassing and spying on people, beating them up, taking their money, throwing them in cages. In other words, the most basic functions of the system. Why would they get punished by the system they work for, for any reason other than the system needed a scapegoat? Speaking of cops, cop-loving bootlicker Kyle Rittenhouse gunned down three people in the street and hasn't faced any punishment as of this recording. But God help you if you sell drugs to a willing buyer. Have you ever heard of government or corporate bureaucrats getting in trouble for approving the building of a pipeline that ends up destroying someone's sacred land, or writing a report that aids an occupying military, or separating children from parents and leaving them to rot in cages? Of course not. Blame flies right over their heads. Most blame in politics goes to politicians, and there are reasons for that. The main one being they're the only agents of the system voters have some slight power to remove from office. So blaming them and voting them out feels like you're doing something positive. We're told we're punishing them. So we might be punishing one or another politician, but the system remains intact and as strong as ever. Their politicians are more of a distraction. Don't look at the whole system. Focus on this one guy and put all blame on him. But they're still protected by the system. Their job is to serve corporate interests, which might include starting wars, criminalizing more activities, building more prisons, etc. They don't get punished for it. They get rewarded. Worst you can do is vote them out. Ooh, big punishment, since that just means they'll become a consultant for some industry they were supposedly regulating, and make six or even seven figures doing nothing. With all that said, punishing those people is not a solution. It will do nothing to change the system that created them, which will just find new people to replace them in the same seats with the same power. Some leftists cheer as a government executes a token rich guy, when all it does is strengthen the state vis-a-vis -vis everyone else. Must be awesome to live somewhere everyone is terrified of the state rather than just the poor. But I'd prefer not to. If you've heard enough propaganda, you know no one is to blame. It's never anyone's fault. Anytime there's some fiasco, you can be sure blame will be minimized, either confined to one or two people, or ultimately to no one. It's a cycle of buck passing. Think of a war. The politician says, I'm just doing what the people voted me to do. The bureaucrat says, I'm just serving our democratically elected leaders. The lobbyist says, hey, I'm obliged to do what's best for the bottom line. The cop says, uh, I'm just enforcing the law, or I thought he had a gun. The soldier says, hey, I'm just fighting for the guys next to me, or I need college money. This is a great example of a conspiracy in plain sight. All these people conspire to make war on other people, and no one ever admits they were wrong. Now, if you conspired to, say, rob a bank of $20,000, you'll probably go to jail. But if you only conspired to kill a million people and thereby transfer trillions of dollars in wealth to the rich, you get rewarded. 
So while these people might not have announced they consent, they come as close as anyone. While they're victims, they're also perpetrators. They are the reason the system continues to exist. For those of us with consciences, we have options, however limited. The most important thing is to never join these institutions in the first place. You will be part of the problem. If it's too late and you're already there, you could blow the whistle or otherwise sabotage operations, but that kind of thing carries pretty big risks. If you're outside the institution, you might be able to bring it down, but only with others who agree with you. The opposite of consent is dissent, like disagreeing and protesting. But dissent tends to only strengthen a fake democracy, as the people in power can say things like, See, you have freedom of speech, and things could be much worse. Look how politicians get ridiculed every night on these comedy news programs like the Colbert Report. Dissent doesn't stop them. The way to stop oppressive systems is to disobey. One person disobeying isn't enough. It might inspire other people, but on its own, it just means you'll get fired or go to jail. But when enough people refuse to follow orders, the system is revealed as pure coercion and violence. I think consent should be the founding principle of society, and to an extent it is. Civil society is about peaceful, egalitarian, voluntary interaction among its members. We lived this way for most of our history. I see no reason why, just because now we have cities and iPads and airplanes, we couldn't possibly build a society based on consent. If people are violating others' consent, we stop them. If social institutions are not based on consent, we get rid of them and start something better. Then they would actually be legitimate. Otherwise, they're just force. Thanks.